without further ado, please put your hands together for really one of God's choice servants, Pastor Mike Ware. Amen. Sit down. I'm glad you're here tonight. Amen. Well, thanks for coming back tonight. And uh, I believe the Lord's going to bless you for that. I believe He's going to bless you for that because I've got a word for you. I don't have a message. I have a word that I believe is going to encourage you. Karen, I was thinking about you in the third service. You had slipped out. And, and um, you know, Mary had a choice. You know, the Lord, the angel of the Lord came and said, Mary, if, you, if you'll conceive this seed, you'll give birth to the Son of God, Emmanuel. And uh, she had a choice. She could have said no. But she said yes. She said, be it unto me according to your word. A little while later, she gave birth to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And it was more than just giving birth to the Son of God. She gave birth to the purpose of God. God's purpose was to bring salvation into the earth. And He did so through His Son. And like Mary, Karen, you had a choice. You could have said no. But instead, you said yes, and you conceived a seed on the inside of you. And, and you said, Lord, be it unto me according to your word. And I don't know if this is off the wall. You just have to judge it. And if it is, you can just say, well, you know, Pastor Mike's off because I'm, I'm off a lot, you know. Jeannie thinks I'm off all the time. But she knows me real well. But I believe you've conceived in you the purposes of God. You're pregnant with them. I don't know what they are. And I don't know what God wants to do in them or through them. But I just believe that you're going to give birth to them. That you're going to start feeling the, the, the birthing pains. You're going to begin laboring to give birth to the, I call it the purpose of God. You're pregnant with God's purposes. And you know, maybe that's something deep in your heart and spirit. Nobody else knows about it in this room. I don't know. But I believe God's getting ready to do something. I believe you're getting ready to go into travail and to labor. And you're soon going to be delivering this thing that God has put in you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this precious lady. Lord, as she, like Mary, said, yes. Be it unto me according to your word. Lord, she's been waiting a long time, pregnant with this seed for a long time. And we're just asking you right now to bring this to fruition, to bring this to pass, that she would bring forth, because that's what Mary did. She brought forth the purpose of God into the earth. Lord, let her bring forth by your strength and by your power and by your anointing this thing you put inside of her. And Lord, let there be rejoicing in the name of Jesus. We're grateful in Christ's name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, again, it's so good to be here tonight. We love Alaska. We like the long days, but we're not here in the wintertime when you only have like an hour and a half of sunlight. <laughs> so I told your pastor, he said, people don't respect preachers when they come in the summertime because they go fishing all the time. You know, that's why they come is to go fishing. And I'm going to do that next year when I come. We're going to figure it out. But I told him, I said, I'll come in January. I'll come in February. You just tell me when you want me to come. The worst of all the weather, and I'll be here. Deal. Is that a deal? Because that doesn't matter to me. I love the people. And I love what God wants to do in this church. And I'm excited about the future of this church. And what he's doing and what he's done in these years that your pastor's been here and that you have been here. And uh, I'm pretty charged up about it. It's exciting to watch it. Well, um, I'm just going to jump into this word. Is that Okay. And uh, I'm just hoping that you'll grab and grasp, um, you know, I believe uh, what God wants to share with you tonight. You know, they were on their way to the next city. Now, every place they had been to, they had seen the power of God. They'd seen miracles. I mean, they were, inc they were incredibly successful in every village. In every city, every town they came to, it seemed like nothing was impossible. I mean, blind eyes were opened. Those that couldn't walk rose up. Those that were possessed by some kind of a spirit had gotten free. Somehow they'd gotten a breakthrough. I mean, they laid hands on people. They were healed. The afflicted found deliverance. I mean, it was an unbelievable spectacle of God's power. Every place they went... I mean, I don't even know if I have words to describe what really took place. When they preached, multitudes came. 
when they taught the Word of God, people just hung on every word. When they realized that they could receive salvation and it didn't cost them anything except a commitment, they freely received. It was just unbelievable. Those men who preached the Word of God, they were filled with joy, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And everywhere they went, they found the power and the presence of God. Everywhere they went, they planted churches. And, of course, now they're on their way to the next city. It was just down the road. I mean, nothing could stop them. I mean, one village after another village, one town after another town, one city after another city. They saw the powerful hand of God working. And uh, they were in a flow with God. Am I, I hope I'm describing this well. But they were in a flow with God, with the presence and the power of God. And as I was saying, it didn't seem like anything could stop them, but suddenly... It was as if the Holy Spirit arrested them and would not let them go any further. And they thought, well, this is ridiculous. Why wouldn't God want us to go any further? Every city we've come to, every village, every town we've come to, the hand of God was there, the power of God was there, and the next village was only a few miles down the road. I mean, why wouldn't God let them go to the next village? He prevented them. They were puzzled. It didn't make sense because things were going so well. Why would God want them to stop? And in the night, a vision of a Macedonian man came into the heart of Paul. He said, come and help us. Do you remember Acts 16? He said, come and help us. Come, we need you. Come over to Macedonia. In that moment, Paul the Apostle got a word from God. And he and Silas the next morning after he had had that vision, after he had the dream, after he got the word from God, I mean, immediately the next morning, after the wooing and the urging of the Holy Spirit, the next morning he and Silas got up and immediately went to Macedonia and brought the gospel into that part of Eastern Europe, which spread across Europe, which spread across the Atlantic Ocean, which spread across America, all the way up to Alaska so that you could have the gospel, all because one man got a word from God. One man got a word from God. And I want you to grasp something from this story in Acts chapter 16. One word, one vision, one dream can change everything. It changed their direction. It changed their priorities. It changed their focus. It changed their ministry plans. Can I tell you what happened? When they heard that word, it began to multiply the kingdom of God. Can you imagine what would happen if sometime this year, in the night hours, or in the early morning, that you felt a little nudge of the Holy Spirit, that you had a little urging of the Holy Spirit, that you had a word from God. Can I tell you what will happen? Your family would change. Your finances would change. Your destiny would change. Your life would change. Just one word. Just one word. Think about the men who are washing their nets. And Jesus walked by and said, follow me. Just one simple little word. He said, follow me. And it changed their lives and their destiny forever. Think about when Jesus said, drop your nets on the other side of the boat. It changed their financial destiny. One word changed their financial destiny. Think about that for just a moment. The power of God could be unleashed in unknown ways. And what I want to do is I want to talk to you tonight about getting a word from God. You and I need a word. We, look, we need a word to recalibrate ourselves, to reset our spiritual compasses. We need a word from God to help us continue, that would change our destiny, that would change our future. I mean, think about the leper who came to Jesus. He said, if you will, you can make me clean. And, and Jesus simply said, well, I will. One little word changed his life and his destiny. Think about it. One word, one simple word. Like Jairus, whose daughter had, had died, and Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. I mean, that one simple word gave him strength and courage to go to his home and believe that Christ could raise his daughter from the dead. One word. When God said to Moses, uh, stretch out that staff as he pointed it across the Red Sea and that sea split open and they crossed over and a nation was saved. One word changed the nation. One word is all it takes. One word. One word. One word. One word from God is all you need to ignite your passion. One word is all you need to raise your faith and to launch into the deep and to give you hope and to part the seas that seem to be standing in front of you. It only takes one word, one thought to propel you. You know, the devil, he doesn't have to kill you to destroy you. All he's got to do is give you a word, a thought. You remember Naaman, the leper? He goes to see uh, Elisha to be healed 
Elisha didn't even come out of the house. He sent his servant, Gehazi. Gehazi said, just go wash in the river seven times, you'll be all right. And, and Naaman got all upset. He said, well, I thought the man of God would come out and wave his hands over me and say all these big words. And I thought, and he left in anger. He left in a fury. And his servant said, look, all he said to do is just go wash in the river. Wash in the river. One word. Look, one thought almost ruined his life because he almost ran from the word of God. Go wash in the river. I don't know how many times it's recorded in the Scripture. I tried to count them. All the places in the Bible where it says, and the word of the Lord came, and the word of the Lord came. And then right after those few little words, after the word of the Lord came, you see where people's lives were changed, destinies of nations were changed because of the word of God. The word of God, the power of God was demonstrated the anointing that breaks the yoke was released because of a word of God. A word of God. Look, I'm convinced that everyone here, I know you're believers. You're, you're the Sunday night crowd. You're the believers. You're the salt. But you know what? Every one of us need a word. I'm not talking about a word by somebody laying hands on it. I'm not talking about that kind of word. I'm talking about a personal word from the Holy Spirit that He speaks to you directly about you, about your life, about your future. That you can take that one word and see your destiny change. A word that brings clear vision and direction. We need a dream. We need a vision. We need the fresh wind of God to blow into our lives. And one word from God can direct you into a place of His mighty power and presence. There's somebody here tonight, you need a word. You're in trouble. You're confused. You don't know what to do. You're at the fork of the road. You don't know where to turn. You've got to make decisions in your life. And you need a word. Some of you have been doing very well, and you've been on the same path for so long, but you need a word. Because God's trying to change some things in your life, and you need a word. You need a word. I'm talking about a word that can guide you to a place of deeper anointing, that can recalibrate your spiritual compass, that can reset your life. You need a word. I, I don't know if I, I hope, I mean, I, I'm hoping and praying you understand what I'm saying by, you need a word. You don't need, me to, you don't need somebody to preach to you. You don't need just to read something in the Bible. You need something from the Holy Spirit that will guide you and direct you. My mother, the last four or five years of her life, came to live with us. She's from Louisiana. And she came to live with us. <clears throat> and bless Jeannie's heart, she became the caregiver as my mother began to decline physically. And, um, and she finally passed away about five years ago of multiple myeloma. Have you ever heard of that? It's a blood disease. It's where your, your, uh, the marrow of your bone is not making blood correctly. And the doctor, uh, you know, it was our family doctor, our internal medicine doctor. It was also uh, my mother's doctor during those last few years. He said, you know, that could be hereditary. And so we want to start testing your blood every six months. So he sent me to a hematologist oncologist. That's a cancer doctor for blood, a blood cancer doctor. Just to go get blood drawn so they could just check to see. There were three things they were looking for to see if they were kind of abnormal because if they were abnormal, then obviously we'd have a problem. And so every six months, I went to Dr. Flagel to go have blood drawn. And after about a year and a half, he said, look, there's no need for you to keep coming every six months. Just come once a year because they, they do some preliminary tests while you're there. And then they send the blood off to the Mayo Clinic for the rest of the results. But I'd been there that one particular day, and he's, before I left the office, he said, everything looks really good. He said, just come next year. Just wait for a year and come. Well, two days later, he calls me on the telephone. It was 3.30 in the afternoon. It was on a Tuesday. He said, I need you here tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m. for a bone marrow biopsy. You know, when a doctor says bone marrow biopsy, they're not messing around. And when they feel so urgent that it's 3.30 in the afternoon and they want you there at 7.30 the next morning, it's become urgent. He said, we got some results back. And he said, we noticed that the three areas we were watching have spiked three times their normal limit. And you need to get here now. I said, well, doctor, I said, I'm not going to be there on Wednesday morning at 7.30. Because I preach on Wednesday and I've got to get ready to preach. I said, I can come on Thursday, but I'm not coming on Wednesday. Let me tell you what happened at that moment. When a doctor says, come have a bone marrow biopsy, 
you know that you probably have some problems. The first thing the devil said to me, you have multiple myeloma. You'll live two years, maybe four, with treatment, maybe. In your mind, some of you know what I'm talking about because you've had the word cancer spoken to you by a doctor or some other kind of affliction that the doctor has uh, prescribed to you because of whatever's going on in your body. And voices begin to bombard my mind. You're going to die. I mean, after a while, it's really weird because you start planning your own funeral. It's the strangest thing. It sounds humorous, but I'm telling you, it's devastating. You're sitting there, and there's a battle going on in your mind. And I mean, the devil's trying to kill you. The devil's trying to destroy you. He's trying to bury you. I'm thinking, okay, what do I need to do? How do I sell my property? How do I take care of Jeannie? What do I do at the church? I mean, all these things are flooding my mind. I mean, the voices are so loud, I can't really hear. And I get along with God. I mean, immediately they bombarded me, and I got along with God. I said, God, i got to get a word. I need to hear something from you. It just so happened that particular morning I was reading in Proverbs chapter 12, in verse, verse 21 it says, No grave trouble will overcome the righteous. I grabbed hold of that just like that. I said, Lord, I'm not, and I told the devil, I said, Devil, I'm not righteous by what I've done, but I've been made righteous by the blood of the Lamb. And so for that reason alone, no grave trouble will overcome me. And I'm going to tell you, those voices got louder and louder and louder. I said, God... I was praying, and I heard three little things in my spirit that I had. I just said, it has to be you, God, because I'm not even thinking of it. Here are the three things. I heard three things. Long life, ripe old age, normal. In the midst of all the voices that were trying to bury me, kill me, destroy me, trying to talk me into planning my funeral, where would I be buried? How would I take care of Jeannie? What would I do at the church? In the midst of all those loud voices, I heard a still small voice saying, long life, ripe old age, and normal. I went on the, into the doctor's office that Thursday morning at 7.30. By the way, what's well, kind of humorous as I look back is I was preaching on the, seven, the six things you can't live without is Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. You know, the laying on of hands, the baptism, and, you know, and faith, and the resurrection of the dead. And I was preaching that Sunday on the resurrection of the dead, so I'd been studying death. And then the devil comes along and drops this thing in my lap. And I'm having, I'm gonna, okay, I've got to have a bone marrow biopsy on Thursday. I'm preaching on death on Sunday. And I'm dealing with it in my own mind. But I had a word that said, no grave trouble will overcome the righteous. I had a word that said, Long life, ripe old age, normal. It was like getting to the end of your rope and God put a knot in it. That's what it was like for me. The voices were so loud that I had to, and I understand why Paul the Apostle had a lot to say about the mind. Now, I'd love to come and, and teach you about this sometime. Because, you know, he said in Romans 7, he said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I am doing, I shouldn't be doing. He said, oh, wretched man. He said, what am I going to do? He said, with my mind. I will serve the Lord. He said, you need to cast down imaginations and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. He understood something about the mind. He had a thorn in his flesh. I believe the thorn in his flesh was he could see the, he could see the faces of those that he had killed and martyred, if you will, as he persecuted the church. I think it was something that reminded, every time he closed his eyes, he could see their faces. That's what I think. And it tormented him. That's why I said when you pray in the Spirit, your mind is unfruitful. Some of you need an unfruitful mind. Your mind is virulent. I'm telling you, your mind will start talking to you and telling you all kinds of things that are not God. You need to learn how to cast down and discern imaginations and thoughts that are not from God. Chain it up and drag it to the foot of the cross and say, God, here's one. I'll bring another one to you in just a minute. <laughs> Thursday, I had the bone marrow biopsy. Had to wait... Eight days. Can I just say it like this? It was eight days of hell. Eight days of hell. If you'd have been around me during those eight days, you probably would have thought I needed to be institutionalized. Not because I did weird things. I guess because I said weird things. Like, I'm walking along, and a thought comes, and I realize that's not a God thought. I just say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. That's not from you, God. I know that's not from you. That's from you, devil. And I'm not going to receive it in Jesus' name. And I would just begin to pray in the Spirit. I'm just walking along. 
And I had to be real careful that I didn't do that in front of people. I remember out at our place, out of little ranch there where we live, and I remember walking out there to feed the horses. And I mean out loud, I'm saying, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. That is not from God. And having to bow, I'm telling you, it was the worst thing I'd ever experienced in my life. I don't know even how to describe it. I don't know. Some of you have gone through it. You know what I'm saying. Eight days. Jeannie and I never really discussed it very much. On the way to the doctor's office after eight days, they had gotten the results. We were driving over to Boulder to the uh, Rocky Mountain Cancer Center. That's where the doctor was to get the results. I told Jeannie, I said, you know, I don't know what the doctor's going to say. But in my heart, I've got peace. I said, I don't know what I'm going to have to go through, but I have peace. You know, peace comes from the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? But I had the knot in the rope. I had a word. Long life. Ripe old age. Normal. It was a word. Just from a still, small voice, the little quietness of God's voice during that morning as I had prayed when all the voices were so loud. We got to the doctor's office and we waited. They called us and we sat in his office and we waited. And we waited. That's how the devil is. And we waited. A few moments later, the doctor walks through his door with papers in his hand, shaking them, saying, Normal! Normal! Everything's normal! Woo! Come on, somebody! Can I tell you? It was the same word the Lord spoke to me. He said, I don't understand it. He said, all of our blood gets sent off to the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic doesn't make mistakes. And I said, well, doctor, I said, let me just tell you what I believe happened. And I just gave him a quick testimony that God had healed us or healed me. But I got a word. Can I tell you what? I needed a word. It was that word that helped me get through the... I believe it was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. I needed a word. Some of you tonight need a word. You're here for some reason. And, and I don't know what that reason is, but we live in an ever-increasing time where we rely on ourselves, our skills, our talents, our own abilities, our own experiences uh, in our own past, we rely on that rather than the Word of God. You would rather go to Google to get it instead of going to God to get it. I know what you do. You go to WebMD and everything else and you're just surfing the internet trying to find your answers instead of getting on your knees and saying, God, I need a word. Google will give you a word. But I'm going to tell you, God will give you a word too. I'd rather have a word from God because it's a word from God that will help me get through every storm in this life. I've learned something about God. Is God will not eliminate every trial and trouble and storm that you have in life, but with Him, He'll give you strength to get to the other side. And that's what He did with me. All because of a word. I want to give you some reasons why you need a fresh word from God. And if, if I were you, I would take some notes. Or I would spend $25 for the CD after this service. I don't know what they cost, but the price just went up. <laughs> because this would change your life. Here's some reasons why you need a word from God. Number one is because you cannot operate in an old passion. Listen to what I'm saying. You cannot operate in an old passion. God doesn't operate in old passions. An old passion always gives you old results or no results. You're never going to find joy. You're never going to find fulfillment from an old passion. God, old passions never stir new directions. And God is always renewing our passions and redirecting us in His passions. That's why you need a word from God. Some of you are stuck in the old way, in the old past, with doing the old things and hoping that something will change in your life. That's ridiculous. I just want to say it again. The reason why you and I need a word from God is because you cannot operate in an old passion. You've got to have a fresh word from God from your life. Most leaders and most people try to hold on to what's familiar, what's convenient, what's, what they're used to, and, and, and all of those kind of things. They, they want to hold on to all of those. Because they're afraid, maybe they're afraid of the new. Maybe they don't want to change because the new always requires you to change. The new always challenges you. 
And so people always gravitate to the old. They always gravitate to the familiar. You know, just wait till you, wait till you build a building and people say, well, it's not like the old building. Well, I've got three words for you. Get over it. Because God's doing a new thing in this house. I said God's doing a new thing in this house. And it's not about an old passion, it's about a new passion. That's why you need a word from God. By the way, what you pursue pursues you. Think about this. Let me ask you a question. What are you pursuing? Something old? What you pursue pursues you. You know, God's first words to you are not His last words to you. Why do you make, why do you make the, the first words that God spoke to you His last words? Why do you do this? You know, God spoke to you in 1959. God spoke to you in, in 1977. God spoke to you in, in, in 1999. God spoke to you in 2007. You think, well, that's it. That's all there is. No, you know, that's just the last time He spoke to you. That's not the only time He'll speak to you. Because He's trying to direct you. He wants to give you a word so that you'll have a fresh passion for life. A fresh passion that, uh, of the things that He's calling you to. And if you're talking more about where you've been instead of where God wants you to be, you're living in an old passion. I tell you what's really interesting. We made the transition back in March. If you were not, I don't know if I shared it in all the services, but in March, we made a transition. I pastored our church, founded our church. We made a transition in March to my son. He's now the senior pastor now. I'm just, I'm a nobody, I guess. But uh, we go to church, sit on the front row with our pom-poms. We're the greatest cheerleaders for our church and the vision of our church. But, um, you know, it's pretty exciting because uh, back in November of last year, we had to have a meeting with all of our pastors on the staff because we were planning 2014. And so to plan this year, my son, we had to tell our staff, our pastors, our senior, you know, our senior level guys, we had to tell them that we were making the transition and tell them to hold that in confidence until we could begin revealing that and sharing that with the leadership team and then with the church in, later in December. And give them about three months to kind of get used to the idea. And I'll never forget because most of the guys on our staff now are in their 30s. But there's one guy that's been with me for um, 24 years. And um, he's 62. He's a year older than I am, a year and a half older than I am. And when I made the announcement to share with our pastors, our senior level pastors, what we were doing, I'm telling you, those guys got so excited. There was an enthusiasm and there was a passion like you cannot believe. And I'll never forget turning to look because as Matt, my son, was beginning to share his vision, where he wanted to go in 2014, what he wanted to do, and some of the things he was planning for later in the year once we made the transition, it was like these guys were stepping all over themselves just trying to inject and trying to share a few things. And I looked over there, there and there was this one pastor who was 60-some years old just looking out the window. And I thought to myself, thank God I'm not that. Now, he's a good brother. I'm not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to him, but I'm just saying that you cannot operate in an old passion and have new things. You've got to have a fresh passion from God. You can only get that when you get a word. Are you following me? You've got to have a word. And I'm convinced that when God gives you a word, that brings with it a new passion. And with that new passion comes renewed strength. Isaiah 40, which I know you know this verse. Verse 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I believe that's what happens to you when you get a word. That's number one. Number two, are you ready? God's seasons are God's movements. God's seasons. I'm giving you some wisdom tonight. God's seasons are God's movements. You have to discern the season that you are in. God said to Isaiah in Isaiah 43, he said, forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. He said, see, I am doing a new thing. See, God is trying to share with Isaiah, don't, don't worry about what you've been doing. Don't worry about what you've done in the past. He said, I'm doing a new thing. And now it springs up and don't you perceive it? Don't you see it? Don't you recognize it? He said, I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. He's talking about new seasons. God's seasons are God's movements. That's why you need a word from God because God is going to move into a season. You've got to move with the seasons of God. 
The seasons of our past are past. I'm just telling you right now in Wasella, King's Chapel, KC right here, it's a new season. I hear, I hear this staff and I hear your pastor, and I'm even hearing others talking about the future. You know what it is? I believe the Lord's given you a word. And you're about to enter into a new season. A new season. When a season, or when the season changes, you have to change with the season. When one season ends, another one begins. It's summertime right now. But I'm telling you, winter's coming. And winter is tough on fools. What do you think about that? If you're so foolish that you don't even think winter's coming, and you're out there in a snowstorm, and it's 20 below zero, and you've got your flip-flops on and your shorts, you are a fool because you did not discern the season. You see, God wants to give you a word so you're not a fool, so that you move when He moves. And I've learned something over the years. If you can find the cloud of God, you'll find the fire of God. That'll preach right there, brother. If you find the cloud of God, I can promise you, you'll find the fire of God. And God is not obligated to support you outside of the season that He is in. Put that in your spiritual pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Look, it takes courage to step into the vision, but it takes faith to step into another season. I think KC, and I think you, God wants you to move into another season. I believe God's changing the season. Maybe for you personally. I think in this church for sure, because you've got land. I mean, this church has got a bigger vision than what this, in this property right here. Thank God for this property. This is a fine piece of property. I mean, you've been blessed here. You really have. But this isn't the end. This is just the beginning. Isn't that right? You'll never go to the next level if you're unwilling to move with God. But it's hard to move with God without a word, isn't it? I mean, there's times and seasons and due seasons of God. And by the way, that's a whole other message to talk about all that kind of thing. But you need to settle it today. Where you are right now is just your location. It's not your destination. And to take a step, you've got to be willing to leave a step. You'll never take a step unless you have a word. And when you see that one season is ending... It's just proof that a new season is beginning. Quit fighting the old season. Quit trying to li live, live in a season that God has moved from. And if you aren't satisfied with where you are, can I just tell you right now, if you're frustrated with where you are right now, and you just feel dissatisfaction or uncertainty, I just want to say this. You need a word. I'm trying to make a case for why you need a word. You need a word from God. Because God's vision is always larger than your current role. God's vision is bigger than this current building. God's vision is bigger than what this church has done in the past. Let me give you number three. Old maps don't lead to new places. Old maps don't lead to new places. By the way, I'm sharing with you some life lessons. I'm going to write a book on some of this. On the 37 rules for living life well, I'm giving you four of them tonight. <clears throat> Old maps don't lead to new places. I'll, I'll tell you how I, I got a little revelation on this and why I needed a word from God. Uh, my pastor, of course, Larry Stockstill, he's my age. I'm actually just a few months older than him, but his dad is Roy Stockstill. Roy's 95 years old. I was just with him not too long ago. I mean, he is a spry. He doesn't even use a cane. Sharp as a tack, loves the Lord. He's just a remarkable man. What an incredible, what an incredible example and model I've had for really all of my adult life, particularly my ministry life, to watch men that have integrity like this. But when he was 65, he turned the church over to Larry. Larry was 33 years old, I believe, or 32 years old. And, uh, and Roy, a couple of years later, built, he called it his little chalet, they bought a piece of land in New Mexico. Now, they're from Baton Rouge, you know, South Louisiana. His daughter lived in Santa Fe, and so he bought a little retirement place, a little piece of land, and built a little 1,600-square-foot uh, little chalet on it. It's a little house. And they would go up there during the summer because it was about 7,000 feet of elevation. It was nice and cool. It was very hot and humid in Louisiana. So they would come there in the summer, and they could see their daughter, who was an attorney there in San, uh, Santa Fe, 
And uh, he called me on the phone. We'd only been in, in Colorado a few years. And he called me on the phone. He said, Mike, I'd like you to come up and say hello and visit us. And so I decided, I got the directions from him. He said, when you get to a certain place at this, down this highway, when you get to this crossroad, take a left. He said, and he gave me the landmarks and everything. And so it's about a five, five and a half hour drive. I left on a Sunday after church. And uh, I finally get to this, I had an old map. I had an old map, an old New Mexico map. And I finally got to where this map told me about those particular crossroads. And I got there, and it was not quite dark yet. And the, the, the things that he described that should have been there were not there. And I didn't, I, I said, well, wait a minute, something's not right. And that was kind of before they had cell phones. Do you remember, does anyone remember the days before cell phones when you actually had to dial them you know, with your finger and hope nobody had a zero in the end because you were trying to pull it back around because it took forever? Well, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. It's almost dark. And what he's described to me is the place where I need to turn is not there. I finally find a place to call him on a pay phone. That's where you put money in there and you hear a ding and you dial. And I called him on the phone, and I described to him where I was, and he said, hold on a minute. And he got a map, and he started laughing. He says, you're 160 miles away from me. I had an old map, and New Mexico had built some new roads, and they had changed some of the designation, and I had followed an old map, but I didn't get to a new place. I learned a life lesson. Old maps don't take you new places. They don't lead to new roads. The old map didn't get me there. You'll never find the place of your destiny using an old map. That's why you need a word. You need a word. You need a word. The same old roads will take you down the same old places. You need to throw away the old map. You need to throw away your past map because it's only going to take you down old roads. When God, when God leads you in this life, God... It's not always, He doesn't always lead you on the same old roads. You remember when God delivered Israel from the bondage of the Egyptians after 430 years of being slaves? Do you remember what happened to them? He wanted to fulfill His promise to them to take them to the land of milk and honey. And the way that He led them was on new roads. It was not old roads. I want to read you a couple of verses to verify this, in Joshua chapter two, uh, 3, verse 2 through 4, it says, After three days the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. He said, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest who are the Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go. Watch this. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. God was taking them to the land of promise. They knew exactly how to get there. It was just a couple of days' journey. But God took them way around a different way in a way that they had not been before. God doesn't always take us down the same old roads. You know, you've got to quit buying maps and start making maps. That's what your pastor's trying to encourage you to do. That's what this team of leaders are trying to get you to do as a church is to quit buying maps and start making some maps. There's a new future for this church. It's powerful and mighty. There's a new future for your own personal lives. It's powerful and mighty. You're not going to get there using an old map. That's why you need a word. You've got to get a word from God. Getting a word from God is like getting a new map. And when you get a new map, you get to make new roads. And if you get to make new roads, God lets you be as creative as you want to be. I was just in Ghana, East Africa. I'm sorry, West Africa. I was in East Africa meeting with some leaders, church planters, and we flew over to Ghana, West Africa, and met with leaders there. And uh, right before we left to get on the plane, we went and visited Hew uh, Dag Heward Mills. Your pastor knows who he is. We were in a conference together and heard him speak several times. Powerful man of God. He's a Ghanan from Accra right there. Huge ministry, thousands, multiple thousands of people. He's a medical doctor. Had a call, got a word from God, went to the ministry. All of his upper level staff are all doctors, or professional people, attorneys, and so on. I met him. A lot of the bishops that work there are professional people that have a love for God. It's the most amazing thing. He has become the new Reinhard Bonnke of Africa. I don't know if you know this. Reinhard Bonnke, if you've ever heard, my favorite of his, I love this man from Germany. 
I mean, they'll have a million people on a field. In two days or three days, they'll see two million people come to Christ. It's the most remarkable thing. Uh, Dag Mills, a Ghana, an African himself, has been going around Africa doing crusades like Reinhardt Bonnke. Reinhardt's retiring. Daniel Kalinda, who's now doing that, he's a young man, he's in his 30s, is going around doing these crusades around Africa. And he's doing a tremendous job, by the way. But God is doing a new thing. It's a, it's a, it's a new road. And we were being told by these men that they have, Dag Mills has nine semi-trucks that are loaded with tents, uh, equipment, million-watt amplifiers to be able to amplify sound onto big fields. And they're going all over the nation, or rather the continent of Africa, doing these crusades, and millions of people are getting healed and delivered and freed and saved. But listen to this. They were telling us that there are sometimes no roads getting into some of the nations. They can't get from one where they're at to another nation because of problems or conflicts or political whatever. He said they actually have a crew of people that go before them, and they actually are making roads to cross borders to get into the nations that are in that continent to bring the gospel to see millions saved. You know what that's telling me? It's not telling me old, road, old maps don't lead to new places. You're going to have to make some new roads. If you're going to get some, that's why you need a word from God. When you get a word from God, God's going to let you make some new roads. Now, by the way, when you make new roads, it's going to require new skills, new abilities, new talents, and it's going to cost you something. When you build a road, it's going to cost you something. When you build a building, it's going to cost you something. It may be a toll road for a while. That's what I call it. It may be a toll road for a while. You're going to have to pay for it. But old, listen, an old map will not get new places. Old maps do not lead to new roads. There's always a price and a cost for growth, and there's always a price for increase. It's always going to cost you something. Now, in this room, as I look around, I mean, not everyone here in this room is necessarily young people. And, uh, you know, a lot of you are, but some of you are not necessarily young people. You are seasoned. I guess that's a good way to say it. You're maturing. You're experienced. You're 29 or 39 plus tax. The tax keeps going up. The truth is you're actually getting old. You're aging. Your pastor's halfway to 96. Do your math. But God has chosen you for this hour. God has chosen you for this hour. There used to be a Joshua Caleb generation when these men were young. When these men were young, they believed they could take cities and defeat giants. And they did. And when they were older, in their 80s, they believed they could defeat cities and defeat, you know, take cities and defeat giants. And they did. This is what I want you to get. Age should be a number, not an excuse. If some of you are saying, well, I've been there, done that. Oh, yeah, I used to come to church and I used to be involved. <laughs> I'm just coming now to hear the preacher preach. You're making an excuse. Because you aren't old people with old maps on old roads. You're seasoned people with new maps on new roads. And Jeannie and I have driven around a little bit over the last couple of days. Your pastor's let us use his old truck. And we've noticed something, that no matter how old you are, no matter how old you are, you can take an old car down a new road. Hello, that'll preach right there. You can take an old car down a new road. And I don't care how old you are in this building right now. You can take your old carcass and go down a new road. You need a word. Number four, the fourth thing. God does not bless you everywhere. He blesses you somewhere. God's word to you is designed to move you from places you don't want to go. That's why you need a word from God. Some of you are stuck in a rut. And God is trying to move you out of that rut. And that's why he wants to give you a word. And you'll never discern the beginning of a new season if you don't discern the expiration of an old one. So God's Word to you creates the new season. Every season has a time. Every season has a place. And every season God gives you has a season. No, nothing lasts forever. Mountaintops don't last forever. And valleys don't last forever. Isn't that right? It's true. Anytime you stay past the season, you stay past the freshness and the power that that season provides for you. 
Some of you are wondering, well, where's the power of God? Where's the miracles of God? Well, maybe you just didn't discern the season. Maybe God moved on and you just didn't, weren't paying attention. In the wrong place, you have to find provision. In the right place, provision finds you. Let me give you the example. Elijah, it was during a famine. There was three and a half years of famine before it rained. It be seven years it was declared. And so they're a few years into it. I mean, cattle are dying. The trees are dying. It hadn't rained. I mean, it was dry as a bone. People were dying. They didn't know what to do. And God sends a light. He got a word and he said, go to the brook Cherith. And so he didn't understand. He just obeyed and went to the brook Cherith. While he was there, guess what happened? Birds came and dropped filet mignons, baked potatoes, donut king donuts. And he had water to drink and food to eat. And then one day, the brook dried up. The season had ended. And God says, go to Zarephath. There's a widow woman there that will sustain you. He got a word. Now, he could have stayed at the brook, Cherith, and, and had nothing to eat and nothing to drink and then would have blamed God. But he got a word and obeyed. And I was thinking about this this afternoon. Some of you are by a dry brook right now. Things aren't going well in your life and you're blaming God. And the reason why is because God's seasons change and you didn't discern it. And He gave you a word and you didn't hear it. Hello, are you here today? He gave you a word and you didn't hear it or you didn't want to obey it. And so now you're blaming God, you're blaming the pastor, you're blaming everything except yourself because I want to say it again, God does not bless you everywhere. He blesses you somewhere. Like, like uh, Isaac who during the famine in Genesis 26, he was leaving like everybody else and God said, no, I want you to stay and plant in the famine. He got a word. And he, looked, he listened to that word and he obeyed that word and he, against his better judgment, he planted in a famine and God gave him a hundredfold return, a multiplication, more than a double portion. Because he got a word. God doesn't bless you everywhere. He blesses you somewhere in the place of your season. That's why you need a word. That's why you need a word. Some of you are at a dry brook right now. And you need a word. You know, Satan will do everything he can to keep you on an old passion, on a wrong path, on an old road, just doing anything. He'll try to lead you somewhere. God is not trying to lead you. And when you stay someplace that you shouldn't, you have to compensate. When you're, when you're staying someplace that you shouldn't be staying, you have to compensate for the lack of grace and favor and provision with stress in order to stay there. That's why some of you are stressed right now or maybe frustrated right now. And that's why you need a word from God right now. Nothing will give you greater confidence and boldness than, we, than when you receive a word from the Lord. One thought. So all it takes is one thought, one word, one thought, one nudge, one urging. Like, like wind through the chimes that are on someplace. Just the little tinkling of the chimes. You just need the still, small voice of God. Because it's not found in the loudness. It's not found in, in, in great things and mighty things. It's sometimes found in a little word, a little nudging, a little impression that you have in your spirit. One little word in the midst of all those voices that are there crying out and flooding your mind. It's just that one little word that God may give you that will change your life and change your destiny. Now I've got more to preach, but I'm out of time. But I want to pray for you tonight. That God will give you a word. God, listen, can I tell you, I believe the Lord brought you here tonight. I do believe that. There's something going to happen for you this year. Something's going to happen to you perhaps this week. Maybe driving home in a little while. You'll have this little urging, this little nudge of the Holy Spirit. And you'll say, well, I wasn't thinking that. That wasn't in my mind. You know what that was? That's the Holy Spirit. Trying to give you something to hold on to. To take you down a new road. To a new place. I just want to say this as, as we pray tonight, as we close tonight. Is God has called you to be map makers, not map buyers. He's called you to be history makers, not history readers. That's what He's called this church to do. And if you're going to go where others haven't gone, to do what others haven't done... And to have what others don't have, can I just say it real simply again? You need 
a word. You need a word. Heavenly Father, tonight, there are some people that are struggling. They're frustrated. They're tired. They've grown weary. Lord, they've been plowing down that same old road, the same old way, all these same old years. And they're tired. But Lord, all they need is a little word, a little nudge, a little urging of the Holy Spirit. Lord, nothing will give them greater confidence boldness, passion, enthusiasm, fire, than to know that they've got a word. Nothing ties a knot at the end of the rope like a word from God. To those that feel like they're at the end of their rope, they're at the fork of the road. They don't know where to turn. They don't know what to do. Lord, it could be in their families right now, trying to make a decision, struggling financially, struggling with relationships, not knowing how to deal with children, it might be dealing with a spouse or with a relative. It might be in their own sinful life, Lord, as they continue to slide away from You and then try to run back and then slide away and try to run back. Lord, they've been on an old path and they need a word from You tonight that will encourage them, that will strengthen them, that will empower them. If you need a word of God, I want you to stand up on your feet. You need a word. Stand on your feet. You need a word right now. If you don't, I mean, if you feel like you're on the right track, you don't need to stand up because everybody else does. I'm just trying to find, do you need a word? Come on, Jesus. Come on, Holy Spirit. I ask you to move in this house. I ask you to move upon these precious, wonderful people who have not been ashamed, Lord, but they have stood, Lord God, in humility. They're saying, Lord, I can't go on. I can't continue on this path any longer. Lord, there's a new season. I've got to discern that season. I need a word, Lord God. I've been on an old road. I'm tired of the old road. I need a new path, Lord God. I need a word from you today. I need a word for, from you, Lord God. And that gentle whisper, that still small voice, Lord, that little nur uh, nudge, that little urging, that little wooing of the Holy Spirit. I need that word from you, Lord God. And whether it be in this service, whether it be when I drive home, whether it be tonight, Lord God, when I pray, or in the morning when I wake up and spend a moment of time with you, whether I'm reading the Word, Lord God, I need a Word from you. I need something that will guide my life, that will change my destiny, change my future, change my family, that will change my finances, that will change my church, that will change my city, that will change my state and change my nation and change the world. Lord God, I need a Word. I need a Word. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. While you're praying for just a moment, wouldn't it be a sin that you would come here tonight? Wouldn't it be a tragedy that you would come here tonight and you're not really right with God? And He wants to speak a word to you, but you're just kind of wandering around and straying in some path that you've chosen that God did not choose. Wouldn't it be a tragedy that He wants to speak something to you that will change your future? Can I tell you why I'm excited about the future? Because that's where I'm going to live all my life. That's why I'm excited about tomorrow. Because I have a word. But you'll never get a word until you hear this one word, forgiven. Maybe tonight there's somebody that needs to reach up to Christ and say, Lord, I need to be forgiven. I need to be washed I need to be made new. Would you close your eyes for just one more minute? I, I, that's not, I'm not trying to be seeker sensitive. I just want people to feel like there's some privacy right now. I mean, your family, you know, but there's just a time where you just need to have a little time with Jesus. I don't want you looking around. I just want you to examine your own heart for just one moment. Or, am I really right with God? Do I really need to take a step? Do I need to hear the word forgiven? I mean, really forgiven. If you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and all your unrighteousness. That's His promise to you. All you have to do is say, that's me, Lord. Is that you? Would you slip your hand up? Put it right back down. Put it up. Put it down. I need to make some things right. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? I need to make some things right. Amen. There's another one. You need to give your life back to Jesus. Father, the Word that we need to hear tonight is the Word forgiven. Lord, we know that we're not perfect. We know we make a lot of mistakes. We know we come short of the glory of God. We know that, Lord. That's why we need grace. That's why we need mercy. That's why we need forgiveness. I ask you to speak that into the heart of my, my dear friends that are here tonight. Forgiveness. Forgiven. Forgiven. 
I want you to hear that word whispered into your ear right now. Forgiven. He's forgiving you. And He's washing you in the blood of His own Son that you might be free. That you might be free. He's given you that word. Father, tonight, thank You for this. And thank You for what You're doing in this church, in these precious people, in this pastor and his family and his dear wife as she and he together pastor and lead this church with this team. I thank You, Lord God, for a word. In Christ's name, amen. Pastor. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Let's bless the man of God. Let's bless the, let's bless the woman of God, the wearers. Let's bless them right now. Let's sow into their ministry. Great word. Great preaching. Hallelujah. Ushers, would you help us? If you need an envelope tonight, go ahead and slip your hand up. They'll come. Praise the Lord. Pastor Mike. Great word. It's the deep end of the pool right there. Glory. Amen. Make out a check. Once again, make it out to KC. We will send a check on to the wares for all of their ministry. Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light upon our path. That you spoke the word, let there be light. God, we still have it. You stand over your word to see it performed. God, thank you. Thank you for a tremendous message tonight, God, that's impacted us. And Lord, bless the wearers, God, all of their efforts and the vision. Bless them, God. Bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ushers, go ahead. Thank you. The love inside of you. Would you stand with us? So pure. So right, it fills all heaven with this love. The love inside of you is so pure, so right, it fills all heaven with this love. Sing, Jesus, Jesus, your love is so amazing. In this joy, I can't explain it. I am caught up in the fellowship. I am caught up in the fellowship. Jesus, your love is so amazing. In this joy, I can't explain it. I am caught up in the fellowship. Come on, sing with us. I am caught up in the fellowship. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy I can't explain it. I am caught up in the fellowship. I am caught up in the fellowship. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy I can't explain it. I am caught up in the fellowship. I am caught up in the fellowship. Would you take someone by the hand tonight? Father, we thank you for what you've done, Lord, this morning, this afternoon. God, how you've spoken to us, encouraged us. 
I pray a release of dreams tonight. Lord, for vision, for clarity. Lord, it's not that you're not speaking. You're always speaking. The problem is we have a hard time hearing. But Lord, help us to discern your voice. As it says in Isaiah, we'd hear the voice of the Lord. It said, this is the way, walking in it. We'd look not to the right, to the left. God, we thank you and praise you that we're history makers, we're map makers, we're blazing a new trail no matter how old or how young we are. So Lord, fulfill all of your dreams that you have for us, even before the beginnings of the foundations of the world, Lord, you knew us, you knit us together. And God, we're asking, Lord, you leave not one thing undone with our lives in the earth for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. And Lord, bless your people as they go out into the mission field of Alaska. Encourage them and strengthen them with might in their inner being. Release a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. We would know the hope of our calling. What are the glorious riches of your inheritance in us, the saints? It's an exceedingly great power towards us who believe. That power that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead. And you have given us the same spirit. So as we go forth, God, use us powerfully, I pray. Bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon them. Lift up your countenance towards them. Be gracious to them. Keep them and give them peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you, Delta. We love you. Praise the Lord. God bless all the online folks. We look forward to seeing you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Ministry to the whole family. Praise the Lord. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And the joy I can't explain it. I am caught up in the fellowship. I am caught up in the fellowship, Jesus, your love is so amazing, and this joy I can't explain it, I am caught up in the fellowship.